in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you're representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
So colleagues, as you'll recall, we were interrupted by a fire alarm this morning, so we fell a little behind schedule. We have two very quick items that we need to take care of from the morning session before we get to the afternoon session. The first is item 1010, and it's my understanding that that was read, but no presentation was given. Is that correct? That is correct, but Mayor, I okay. think we have we have three items, I believe. One okay, I show 1010 and then 1011, I'm told. And then 1009, right? Keelan, I thought you said that earlier. Keelan, Michelle, you. did say that and I was wrong. We only have two items. Oh, cool. All right. Okay, then, great. So, all right. And, sounds good. Thanks. And, and hey, Dan, thank you for, for presiding in a pinch this morning. I appreciate it. Uh, 1010. As long as Keelan's around, we're good. Yeah. Yeah, good. 1010, please. Authorized subrecipient contract with Network for Oregon Affordable Housing for $5,153,525 for the provision of grants in support of land acquisitions for affordable housing development. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Colleagues, this item updates a contract that was approved by Council earlier this year to change the funding source, consistent with technical changes Council approved as a part of the fall bump. The contract is with, is with Network for Affordable Housing, um, NOAA. Per the contract, NOAA is providing grants for affordable housing developers to purchase land for future home ownership development. So with that, I'll pass it to Tanya Wolfsberger at the Housing Bureau to provide more information and answer questions. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, having us back to Council. I think my internet cut out right when um, this item came up um, earlier this morning, so apologies for that um, if you were looking for me earlier. Uh, as the Commissioner said, um, this is just a, a bit of housekeeping. We're, we're bringing this contract back because uh, we swapped out the source of funds um, back uh, when you approved it prior. This was uh, to be funded with state and local uh, fiscal recovery sources or ARPA money, and that those monies have been now swapped out to general funds, uh, which provides a little bit more flexibility in the timeline of when we can, when we need to expend the funds for land acquisitions. Uh, so uh, everything else is, is the same as it was before, just the form of the contract is being updated for the new source of funds. And as Commissioner Rubio stated, this is a contract to, to provide grants through Network for Oregon Affordable Housing, or NOAA, to, for um, acquisition of land to for future development of home ownership, affordable home ownership at 80% AMI or below. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Colleagues, any questions at this point? Keelan, do we have test? Uh, Commissioner Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, real quick, um, because I was behind this when it first got to um, this level. I just want to ensure, Tanya, that the intent of these funds remains the same. It's yes, the intent is not changing, only the source of funds. So like I said, it's a little bit of housekeeping just to to recognize that we're we're swapping out the ARPA funds for general funds. All right. I just have former uh, bureau in charge pride here and want to make sure that this <laughs> continues to be for um, home ownership. Thanks. Indeed. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, mm -hmm. Do we have uh, testimony on this item, Keelan? No one signed up. <clears throat> Very good. This is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Oops. Aye. Aye. I want to thank the bureau for their work on this and thank you, Commissioner Ryan, for your work earlier um, in, in years past as well. I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, I'm really happy to see that the Housing Bureau is showing up for um, really what does allow us to create intergenerational wealth, and um, that is includes home ownership. So I'm really proud that this remains active and the intent remains the same. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. And then the last bit of business from the morning's agenda is taking the vote on item 1011. We have already heard a presentation and had opportunity for public testimony. For the record, I am now up to date on this item. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Ups. Aye. Rubio. Commissioner Rubio. Aye. Sorry. Ryan. 
Yeah, great conversation earlier today and I'm proud of this work moving forward. Bye. Gonzalez. I'm so ecstatic to uh, be accepting these dollars from Care Oregon, who's turned into uh, be a fantastic partner for the city of Portland, addressing the low acuity medical needs of our community. Uh, the story we heard this morning is actually a success story for the city of Portland on multiple fronts. Uh, it really speaks to the need for integrated services for those on our streets, not just behavioral health or medical, but the connection into shelter and then ultimately long-term housing. We heard from someone who started on the streets with medical needs, eventually made their way to a safe rest village, then a task site, and now are in long-term apartment uh, living. And it's, uh, again, we hear about the things that don't go right in our system. This uh, across the board, innovative programs from the city of Portland uh, were what helped get this individual off the street. So uh, I want to th thank uh, Tom Miller and my team for leading the charge on this, uh, the help from Commissioner uh, Ryan's office in uh, fostering the relationship with Kara Oregon. I wholeheartedly vote aye. Really? I am very happy to support this. I vote aye and the ordinance is adopted. Thank you, everybody. We'll now move to the afternoon agenda. Items 1013 and 1014 to be read together, please. Item 1013, accept City of Portland annual comprehensive financial report for fiscal year ended June 30, 2023. And item 1014, present audit of the financial statements for the year ended June 30, 2023. Colleagues, the annual comprehensive financial report sometimes called the CAFR, comprises the actual audited financial results of the city's operations, and it provides information related to the city's overall financial health. The financial report is prepared by the Accounting and Grants Management Division of the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services. It is audited by the independent audit firm Moss Adams LLP. Today, we'll hear from City Controller Ron Vogt, and Accounting Supervisor Kevin Sanders about the fiscal year 2023 report preparation. We will also learn about the results of the audit from audit partners Keith Samovic and Mandy Hale from Moss Adams. I'll now invite Ron and Kevin to begin their presentation. Welcome. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Mayor and City Commissioners. For the record, my name is Ron Butt. I am the City Controller uh, joining me is Kevin Sanders, the supervisor over the financial reporting section. The Accounting and Grants Management Division of the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services is responsible for managing incoming and outgoing grants, paying the city bills, management and training related to systems, establishing financial policies, internal control monitoring, and as we're going to talk about today, internal and external financial reporting. Next slide, please. Uh, we are presenting the annual comp comprehensive financial report for the fiscal year in the June 30th, 2023. The preparation of the report is about a 10 month process. We start planning in January. Uh, and then start engaging with people from all over the city and Moss Adams, who, who is our external auditor. Uh, and they're just there's almost 200 audit schedules that have to be prepared by uh, the bureaus and us. And so most of them get submitted to uh, Moss Adams for review. Uh, it's a long and interesting process uh, that uh, we have now completed again for another year. Uh, next slide, please. Now we'll take a, through a few slides and try to do a fairly quick highlight of the 2023 report. The annual report complies with state law, generally accepted accounting principle, and was awarded the Government Finance Officers Association uh, Award for Excellent for the 42nd year in a row. Uh, it's something not a whole lot of people have accomplished, but it is important to us. And I think it also has a uh, bearing on our uh, bond ratings and 
shows us to be among the uh, top uh, governmental entities in the country. Next slide, please. Every year we have three goals. Goal number one is to receive an unmodified opinion from Moss Adams on the ACPR and the single audit. The second goal is to have no findings on either the ACPR or the single audit. And the final goal is to deliver uh, the report to our investors and our communities within 120 days and the single audit within 150 days. Uh, I, investors find it really critical to have information as quickly as they, they can. We have over $3 billion of debt outstanding and it's critical for their needs as investors to know uh, what our financial situation is. Uh, next slide. And is this you? I think this is, I think we're going to Kevin now. Well, oh, this is it. Thank, thank you, Ron. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, and members of the City Council. For the record, my name is Kevin Sanders, and I'm the Accounting Supervisor for the City's Financial Reporting Team. The City's accounting system tracks transactions using three measurement focuses and two bases of accounting. Most discussions about City finances focus on the budgetary basis uh, and modified or basis of accounting, since this is the basis that most often guides the Bureau's operations but that financial statements primarily report using the other two measurement focuses. The supplemental schedules, 2% schedules using, using the budgetary basis and modified accrual basis of accounting, however. The emphasis of our presentation today will be on the government-wide financial statements, which use the accrual basis of accounting. This is the, the highest level of reporting within the annual report and contains the most comprehensive, comprehensive picture of the city's financial situation. The government-wide statements are made up of two parts, those being governmental activities and business type activities. Governmental activities are made up of governmental funds, such as the general fund, and our internal service funds, such as technology services. These type of funds are generally funded by tax revenues and grant revenues. Business type activities are our enterprise funds, such as water and BS, which pro provide services directly to our citizens in exchange for a fee such as water and sewer bills. Next slide. This slide is showing us the various components that make up the yearly net change in government activities in that position, which went from the negative 1.7 billion to negative 1.4 billion during this fiscal year. Uh, this highlights the unique nature of government where many activities are not intended to fund themselves, but are instead funded through tax revenues. For example, here we can see that core city services such as public safety, and community development have expenses that outweigh any revenues earned through those programs. However, adding up all the inflows and outflows with the tax revenues shown on the right, uh, we get the 300, roughly $300 million increase in governmental activities in that position. Next slide. Uh, this slide here is showing us the 10-year trend of the revenues and expenses over the governmental activities section. Uh, what we're seeing is a continuation of the previous year's trend uh, with revenues exceeding expenses, which is contributing to this to the city's improved net position. Next slide. So this is our final slide for governmental activities uh, and showing us the trends of capital assets and bonds payable over this period. We see that capital assets have increased over this period and uh, total bonds payable have been decreasing. I'll now turn the presentation back to Ron who will We'll present information on the business type activities. Next slide. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, then we'll talk about business type activities. Uh, net position increased by 243 million during the fiscal year from 3.6 billion to 3.9 billion. Uh, the city's environmental services and water operations contributed 141 million and 91 million, respectively, to that increase. Overall, we saw increases in charges for services and investment income, along with increased expenses for business type activities for the year. Next slide. 
This slide again is showing uh, a comparison of charges for services and expenses. Uh, for, we're just focusing on the, the two big enterprise funds. Now we have a multitude of smaller ones like golf and PIR and solid waste, environmental remediation, and uh, spectator facilities. But these are the by far the, the two big uh, ones in this group. As opposed to the governmental activities, the business type activities are intended to fund themselves through the charging fees. And you can see that this is indeed has been accomplished. And in both cases, uh, fees out, out, uh, outweigh uh, expenses. Now you have to keep in mind that this, this is uh, the economic uh, resources uh, measurement focus and accrual accounting where most of what you see is uh, the budgetary basis of accounting and uh, modified accrual. So this takes a little bit different perspective than what you see in all the budget uh, presentations. Next slide. And this is showing our trends again for revenues and expenses over the years. Uh, what we see is that the funds have remained fairly constant over the year in the expense category. Uh, while well, revenues have been climbing. The, the delta between these two lines is uh, the principal payments on, on the, the debt that they have outstanding. And we have seen some uh, growth in the net position of, of these funds over the years. So that's kind of what you're seeing here. Uh, next slide, please. And again, we're looking at a comparison of uh, the capital assets and the bonded debt. So you can see here that bonded debt has pretty much re remained stable over the course of the 10-year period while uh, capital assets <clears throat> have been increasing. And you kind of expect that uh, the bonded debt has a 20-year life where much of what uh, BES and water build has like a hundred year life. So the depreciation on those assets is gonna be uh, a lot slower than, than the payment on the debt. So you, you would kind of expect to see this kind of a trend analysis. Uh, and I think that's all we have. Uh, at time for questions and uh, any public comments, and then we need to have a vote on just accepting this because it's not a the city auditor doesn't feel it's appropriate to uh, be voting on on uh, their uh, presentation. So. Yeah, and and just just for the record, um, and perhaps I should have said this up front, uh, we will be voting on this separately, and then the auditor will be making. Uh, her report will take any testimony that comes with that report, but it is really her her efforts are a presentation to the council. So we won't actually be voting on the auditor's piece. We'll just be voting on this piece. So colleagues, is there any uh, question before we get to public testimony? Keelan, do we have public testimony on this particular item, 1013? We do, we have one person signed up. All right, why don't we hear from them? Kevin Matches. Welcome. We see you, Kevin. You're still muted there. Thank you. I'm Kevin Matches. I recommend that the city request an analysis of a comprehensive actuarial funding policy for the Portland Fire and Police Disability and Retirement Pension Plan. It has been 18 years since the city last obtained this analysis. Uh, next slide. There are several benefits to abandoning the city's current pay-as-you-go pension funding policy. I'd like to elaborate on intergenerational equity and risks to the city's financial condition. Uh, Commissioner Ryan, uh, you spoke of the importance of 
generating intergenerational wealth um, today. Uh, unfortunately, the city's current policy is to destroy intergenerational wealth. Uh, next slide. In 2013, uh, the public accounting firm uh, that audits your financial statements, Moss Adams, who you're, I think, about to hear from, uh, wrote a warning to city council, quote, government, governmental net position has decreased from 1.788 billion to 0 0.355 billion, end quote, over 11 years. They further explain that, quote, the net position trend is a measure commonly used to determine whether a government's financial condition is improving or declining. It also measures, it, it, it is also a measure of how well the city's financial policies are addressing intergenerational equity, end quote. They emphasize that, quote, one often overlooked consequence is the inherent unfairness that results when future generations end up paying a significant portion of costs by past users. In addition, there is increased risk that the portion of current revenues that are required to make the payments against prior obligations will not allow sufficient resources left over to maintain current service levels, end quote. Uh, next slide, please. How has governmental net position fared since Moss Adams sent their warning to council? This chart shows that the city of Portland's uh, governmental net position over time. On the left is that positive 1.788 billion for 2002 mentioned by Moss Adams. In the middle is the positive 0 0.355 billion uh, mentioned by them for 2013. And on the right is the latest figure, negative $1.428 billion. Governmental net position has turned deeply negative. Uh, next slide, please. So why has governmental net position suffered so much? A key driver is the Portland FPDR pension plan. Each year that goes by, city the city incurs pension interest costs and pension normal costs, or sometimes called service costs. Those are added together and shown in black on this chart. How are these costs paid for? That's shown in green. Contributions into the plan. The difference highlighted in red is negative amortization. And you'll notice that the city uh, consistently engages in negative amortization every year. Negative amortization detracts from the city's governmental net position and unfortunately has resulted in Portland running the most costly pension system in the United States. Uh, next slide. In summary, Moss Adams warned the city about its declining governmental net position trend a decade ago, and things have further deteriorated since then. They correctly point out that the trend was detrimental to intergenerational equity and increased risks to current service levels. I recommend that the council take the first step to addressing these problems by requesting an analysis of an actual comprehensive actuarial funding policy. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Commissioner Maps. Uh, I have a question for um, uh, the folks who did the audit. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you identified three goals uh, that you tried to achieve through this process. Uh, having an unmodified opinion, uh, having no findings, and meeting some uh, deadlines. Just to be clear, did we achieve all three of our goals here? We, we most definitely did. Okay, great. Thank you. No more questions. Great. And and I, I don't want to just brush off Kevin's testimony, and Kevin's been with us previously as well. Um, and uh, I think prior councils did take heed to that advice, and as a result of that, um, new city employees in recent years have all been going on to the PERS system, which is an investment-based portfolio, whereas what the uh, police and fire pension system is based on here at the city of Portland is a pay-as-you-go system. In other words, taxpayers fund it. It is fully funded, but I and others would argue that that type of a system shifts the risk to the taxpayers. And I, I think Kevin is is right to raise that as a concern. That being said, the city did take the right step in order to move new employees off of that pay as you go system off of the taxpayers towards an investment based system. And that's obviously not without risk or exposure to the taxpayers, but at least it is based on um, a sustainable investment portfolio as opposed to just being related to tax proceeds. Commissioner Maps. Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you for engaging in Kevin's uh, inquiry and thank you for the clarification. Um, I appreciate this uh, this conversation too. I, I just actually have a question for you, Mr. Mayor. Um, given your understanding of what's going on here, um, will Portland, I, Will Portland eventually age out of this this particular dilemma that we're talking about? Well, as somebody who's 61, I can tell you I, I 
somewhat chagrined to say that we will age out. Yeah. Um, you, you don't want to age out of a pension system. Let me just put yeah. it that way. Uh, but yeah, I, I believe what I have heard from the investment professionals, and I want to be clear, I am not one. Uh, but what I've heard from those who have presented as part of our annual presentation on the pension system, and Kevin was good enough to show up and testify and ask good questions then as well. Uh, my understanding is, yes, it is It is a long tail liability to be sure, but ultimately what you will see is that liability decline as people who participate in that pension system, as you say, age out. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that clarification. As, as we all will someday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, any further questions or comments, colleagues? Uh, item number 1013 is a report. I will accept the motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second, please? Second. second. Commissioner uh, Rubio, I believe that was. Seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Yeah. Thank you, Ron and Kevin, for the presentation, all your work on this. I vote aye. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Uh, I vote aye, but I also want to say thank you to the Accounting and Grants Management Division and Moss Adams for once again uh, contributing thousands of hours of hard work and doing excellent work in the preparation of the audit uh, of this report. Uh, we have good news to celebrate from my perspective. The fiscal year 2023 financial report received an unmodified opinion from our auditors and our credit remain, rating remains AAA during a period of what has largely been described as unprecedented financial uh, uncertainty. While we're weathering the current economic challenges well, we must continue to maintain stable fund balances as well as liquidity while simultaneously monitoring our performance and liabilities to ensure long-time financial stability. That said, of course, I support this. The report is accepted. Thank you uh, to all who presented. And with that, then we'll move on to 1014. Keelan has already read it. I will turn this over to Auditor Reddy. Welcome, Auditor, and thank you for your patience. Thanks for having me. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. I am City Auditor Simone Reddy. Uh, joining me today are Keith Simovic and Mandy Hale. Uh, they are a partner at Moss Adams and a manager at Moss Adams, respectively. As part of the City Auditor's Office mission to ensure open and accountable government, I'm going to be presenting our audit work to you periodically. Um, city Charter makes my office responsible for auditing the performance of our city government, as well as overseeing the annual audit of our city's financial statements. Presenting our work publicly allows the community to engage with it. Uh, next slide, please. I first want to explain the difference between performance audits and financial audits. Performance audits review the efficiency, effectiveness, and equity of one city program or service at a time, and the topics and methods are at my discretion. By contrast, a financial audit is a review of the financial statements and follows state and federal law as well as accounting standards. The objective of this financial audit was to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements as a whole were free from material misstatement or whether they were significantly off. Next slide. I want to take this opportunity to highlight the various roles that everyone played. Accountants from the Office of Management and Finance prepared the financial statements and management, which includes you as commissioners in charge, is responsible for preparing the financial statements and putting internal controls in place. By city charter, the city auditor oversees the financial audit, and this separation between the auditors and management enhances independence, which increases trust in the results. We contracted with the firm Moss Adams to complete the financial audit. Um, and as the mayor mentioned, we have good news to share. The city received a clean audit opinion. The outside auditors concluded that the city's financial statements are an accurate reflection of the city's finances. 
The financial statements and audit are an important resource for community members, as well as taxpayers and, and investors who buy the city's debt, as well as decision makers like you. Interested parties can use them to see what financial shape the city is in. The outside auditors also completed an audit of the city's spending of federal grant money. They reviewed a list of the types and amounts of spending of federal money and our compliance with federal requirements. In addition, the auditors issued a letter to you describing how the audit went, plus other issues that are required by audit standards. And I'm pleased to share that there were no difficulties or disagreements between the auditors and city management. The auditors would also be required to report certain problems if they found them in the city's internal controls over financial reporting. Those are processes such as review to ensure that the financial statements are reliable. We also received good news in this area. The auditors found no material weakness and no significant deficiencies and they found no instances of non-compliance that would have to be reported. I appreciate city staff in the Office of Management and Finance and all bureaus for facilitating a smooth audit and answering requests from the outside auditors. I wanna thank Moss Adams for their continued excellence and professionalism in performing financial audits on our behalf. And as the mayor mentioned, we're not asking for council action on this presentation. But if you have questions uh, after today, my office can set up a meeting with you and your staff upon request. Min Dan Vung, the contract manager financial, for financial audits in my office is here to answer questions and can also set up a briefing after today's presentation. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Keith and Mandy, after which we can hear public testimony as well as your questions. Perfect. Thank you, Auditor Reddy. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Uh, happy to be here, uh, Mayor Wheeler and, and fellow commissioners, uh, to present the results of the June 30th, 2023 financial statement audit. I think you just got a lot of great information, a lot of the, all, all the good news up front there, which is fantastic. And seeing that list of all the goals that were achieved during the year, uh, you could hear some of that directly from us, but we'll fill in some of the gaps too, in terms of how the audit went and give you a, a little more insights into, into the process overall. So you get to hear a little bit from me uh, and then Mandy. Andy Hale, who's here with me today as well. Go ahead and advance the slide. So we're going to introduce you real briefly to our engagement team and not just uh, the key members for, for this team, for the city's ACFR, the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report Audit, but all the other uh, related components that uh, and audits that we do for uh, various city entities as well. So you get a good feel for the uh, breadth of the services that we provide. We'll go through what does a financial statement audit really entail? What's the process that we go through? What are the areas that we're looking at? Uh, you get a little bit better, better flavor of the audit process through that. Uh, and then we're gonna go through our final results, which you heard some of those, but there's a few more that we wanna share too. Uh, and then finally, we'll go through the highlights in the additional letter that we uh, issue, which is called our communication to those charged with governance. Uh, so we're gonna hit up some of the, the key areas there too. Go ahead and advance the slide. All right. So this is the first slide of our engagement team. There's many more folks that were in, involved in this engagement. And I think, uh, and Mandy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think we've got somewhere around 10 to 11 different auditors involved in the in the city's main financial statement audit uh, throughout, involved throughout this engagement. So a very uh, large number of auditors that are involved for a number of weeks uh, throughout the year that we're, that we're looking at all your various accounts and, and activities for the year. Again, I'm Keith Simovic, uh, overall engagement reviewer, uh, responsible for setting our audit plan, making sure we're following through on all of our professional standards and all the procedures that we have to do, and ultimately taking responsibility for all the deliverables that we issue. Uh, Lori Tisch that you see pictured on there is involved as our quality control reviewer. She actually leads our firm's uh, government services practice uh, and has uh, dedicated her career to working with governmental entities just like you. So very excited to have her again serve as our quality control reviewer. She looks at certain key uh, work papers in our file and of course all of our final deliverables and that financial statement, that annual comprehensive financial report, making sure that includes kind of all the bells and whistles that the governmental accounting standards require. 
Uh, and then of course with me is Mandy Hale. You'll get to hear from her in just a second. She served as the manager. She was responsible for working directly with our staff and seniors that were involved on the engagement, overseeing all of them, uh, doing helping me in review of all of our work papers and uh, managing through on, on our time frame and making sure we're hitting on all of our deadlines for the city too. Go ahead and advance the slide. And these are some of our, our leads on some of the other engagements that we performed for the city. So uh, Harvey Wang that you see pictured there uh, was involved in both the uh, individual audit that we do for Prosper Portland because they issue their own annual comprehensive financial report. So there's a separate audit just for that entity. Uh, and then Harvey also leads our audit, or what we call the single audit. That's the audit over the uh, federal funding that the city receives and spends during the year. So a, a compliance audit for how you are spending those funds in line with the underlying grant agreement. So happy to have Harvey serve in that role again this year. David Levitsky served as our lead senior uh, for our Prosper Portland team. So he worked very closely with me and Harvey on that engagement. Ed Solian uh, was our lead on the utilities performance uh, portion of the city's audit engagement. And then Elise Horsley is a senior manager and she was able to help us out with the audit of FPDNR because that entity gets an individual audit as well. Go ahead and advance the slide. I know there's a lot of words on this slide, but this is just to give you a overview of the different deliverables that we issue out of this process. When you hire an independent CPA firm to come in and audit the city, what are the different things that you can expect to receive? Uh, so this gives you kind of an overview of that. Uh, boxes one and two are related and they're really just one report that we're issuing and probably the one that, that most people are most familiar with. It's gonna be our independent auditors report uh, over the fairness and accuracy of the city's financial statements. So that's through all the, the procedures that we're doing, all the evidence that we're gathering at the city to understand um, uh, whether the, the items that are recorded and reflected in your financial statements are supported by actual underlying substantive documentation, whether that's contracts, agreements, invoices, check disbursements, cash receipts, whatever that support is, making sure that what is recorded and reflected in your financial statements paints an accurate picture of where the city stands as of June 30th, 2023. Uh, box two just takes that a step further in, in to be able to issue that report, we also have to do that technical review of your annual comprehensive financial report. Uh, and, and especially because you're submitting it to the Government Finance Officers Association for that Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting. Uh, you heard that from Ron Vaught, that the city has received that for 42 straight years. I don't know that I have another client that has received that for that many years in a row. So, And that's not a required practice that you go through and submit for uh, that award each and every year. So there's additional things that you have to do, and you're held to a higher standard to be able to uh, up or apply for and obtain that award. So very impressed that, again, that you've got the staff that have the skill set and the ability to put together a complete uh, document that you can submit to the GFOA for that award and receive it each and every year. Box three has to do with an additional report that we issue because we perform the audit in accordance with government auditing standards. It's a little bit different from just general corporate audit standards, a little more stringent in terms of who we can um, put on our team. They have to have a certain uh, continuing professional education and that, that's specific to governmental entities as well. And we also have to report out on if we notice any instances of non-compliance or if we have uh, what would be called significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal controls. Those are the red flag areas you don't wanna hear. And this is the report where you would see those. But of course the, the spoiler alert, which you already heard was we didn't have anything that rose to that level. So very good news there. Box four is a separate report that we issue in line with the state of Oregon's requirements that if we're doing an audit of an Oregon governmental entity, there's other compliance areas they want us to look at. Most notably are gonna be your procurement practices, making sure that you go through the proper uh, channels when you're going out for public procurements, uh, and then also your budgeting uh, process as well. Are you following Oregon local budget law? So that's where we spend the bulk of our time in those reports. And we note if there were any instances of non-compliance with those areas, we note them in that report. And then finally in box five, uh, we issue a report that's attached to your uh, single audit report. And this has to do with whether we found any instances of non-compliance or internal control issues related to how you administer and spend federal grant funds. Uh, box six, we're gonna talk about in just a minute, and that's the additional letter to give you more insight into the audit process, the communication to those charged with governance. Uh, go ahead and advance the slide. So I kind of touched on a, a few of these, but just to give you a, another idea of what are all the different areas that we're looking at. I mentioned the audit of the financial statements of the city, along with the single audit. 
for the federal grant funds that are spent. Uh, Prosper Portland has their own individual audit, their single audit, and any spending of federal funds is combined with the cities. So they are uh, part of that process as well for the federal funding audit. Uh, for FPDNR, Fire and Police Disability and Retirement Funds, they are also required to go through their own individual audit that gets captured within the city's annual comprehensive financial report. So that is something that we that we do and issue separate reports for. And then finally, for the Mount, Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission, uh, we do a separate audit for that entity. Go ahead and advance the slides. In terms of the audit process, to give you a little more flavor for how this process works, we all start with internal controls in an audit process because it's part of our risk assessment. We want to understand, does the city and staff have good internal controls in place? Does it have good policies that are continuously being followed uh, in terms of making sure that transactions flow through the system appropriately, they're appropriately supported by substantive documentation, and that they, things are getting recorded at the right amount? in the right period, that they have an appropriate business purpose, that there are approvals in place. Those are the types of things that we're looking at. So you'll see all the different bullet points on here for the different areas that, that we look at and are captured in the audit process. From there, uh, from our risk assessment process, then we actually get the final numbers for the year after the books are closed. And we do a combination of analytical procedures, really taking that 30,000 foot view of the city and the results for the year to see if revenues and expenses, uh, if things are following along with, with uh, what we're seeing in terms of the budget, as we're reading through the minutes, council minutes, uh, for the year, if we're seeing things that are discussed or approved, and we expect to see certain revenues or expenses coming through because of that, uh, we're going to look back at the actual results and see if that jives. Uh, we're also talking to management and staff, hearing about the various transactions and things that have happened during the year, and looking back and making sure that filters down into the actual results. And then our, where we spend the bulk of our time is going to be our substantive procedures. That's going back and doing the actual sampling to look at uh, detailed transactions, look at the underlying support, and again, making sure are things recorded at the right amount, at, in the right period, uh, classified appropriately in the, in the appropriate fund, uh, and that they have appropriate approvals in place as well. Go ahead and advance the slide. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Mandy. She's going to give uh, the good news overview here. Yeah, thanks, Keith. And as you talked about, you guys did get a clean, unmodified opinion on your financial statements this year, which that's the one that you look for. That's the one that you want. So that's great news. Um, and then as Keith mentioned, there's some of those other reports that we provide, and we didn't have any reportable findings from our government audit standards report, the Oregon minimum standards, or the single audit. So that is all great news to share. All right, go ahead and advance the slide. And real briefly, before I turn it back over to Mandy, uh, so this slide just gives you kind of a bullet point highlights of what is in our separate communication to those charged with governance, which is a letter that we issue as part of every audit that we do. It's required by our professional standards uh, to let you know outside of just, hey, was there a clean opinion or not? Were there findings or not? Gives you a little more insight as to, well, what's changed? And did you run into difficulties along the way? Did you get all the documentation that you requested? Were you given responses to all the questions that you had? from staff and management along the way, which I can say to that, definitely. We, there's, there's probably thousands of pieces of documentation uh, that your team has to pull together each and every year as part of this process. So it's quite the endeavor, uh, but I always appreciate that those items are pulled together. They are provided to us. Anything that we ask for, uh, it's provided to us. Any question that we have, uh, we are given a response. Um, and so that's very, very good news uh, each and every year. Uh, outside of that, there's some other things that we always note in this letter. Did we have any issues with the plan, scope, and timing of the audit? Did we finish things outside of uh, what was agreed upon? Uh, to the start of this process? And the answer is no. Uh, and this is uh, done in a very timely and efficient manner and, and finalized by the end of October, which is uh, definitely one of the earlier um, uh, entities or governmental entities to issue and finalize their uh, audit report uh, after the June 30th year end. So very good news there. Um, in terms of significant accounting policies, there's a section that talks about, is there anything that changed in terms of how the city is accounting for things this year compared to last year? Anything that would change the comparability to how things were presented last year versus this year? Outside of a new accounting standard, 
uh, that comes out from time to time, we wouldn't expect there to really be changes. You want to be accounting for things consistently in the, in the same manner each and every year. There was a new standard this year that had a bit of an impact on any arrangements you have where you have uh, subscription-based IT arrangements, anything where you're basically using the software that's owned by someone else and, and the city doesn't own it and you're making a subscription payment for that. Uh, so that was adopted this year, didn't have a substantial impact on the financial statements, but you'll see that reflected in the financial statements. There weren't any other changes in accounting policies that, that we noted. We did have a couple of audit adjustments uh, that we're going to talk about, and these are classified as what we call past audit adjustments. And uh, what a past audit adjustment is, is something that is actually not reflected in your June 30th, 2023 financial statement, but it's something as we were going along and doing our audit work, uh, items that we noted that, again, was something not recorded in the correct period, was there not documentation for it, um, uh, was it not recorded at the correct amount, you know, those are the types of things that can drive an audit adjustment if it rises to this, a certain level, uh, and if it's uh, not above kind of our materiality thresholds, then this is something where it may not be reflected in your financial statements this year, but likely is already uh, in the coming fiscal year. So we'll talk about that. I'm going to pass it along to Mandy. She's going to talk to you about the couple items that we noted there. Good news with both of those didn't impact your overall, uh, you know, cash balances or anything like that. Uh, it, it wasn't that these items aren't recorded. It's just the timing of when they uh, were recorded. So we're going to talk through those in, in just a minute. Outside of that, we didn't have any, again, material weaknesses, but we do always have best practices from all the governmental entities that we work with. Uh, we continue to provide recommendations uh, to your staff and management uh, as we go along. And typically when we do have uh, items like this, past audit adjustments, we'll have recommendations to address those so you don't see things uh, in the coming years related to these items. Go ahead and advance the slides. All right, Mandy, do you wanna go through these couple items? Yeah, sounds good. So as Keith mentioned, um, these aren't material adjustments. We're not requiring the city to record those, but we are required to bring them to your attention. So the first entry is related to some of the BES construction and process projects. And so that related entry there for $13 million just indicates that these um, that, that dollar amount should have been reclassified into capital assets and moved out of the construction and process um, line item just because of the status of those projects. So this is really more just a matter of where it sits on the balance sheet and just making sure that you guys are getting those moved over timely um, in line with city policy. And then that second entry is just related to some of the cash clearing account activity. So similar to what Keith said, there's no cash missing or any cash not recorded, but we just noted that at year end, some of the cash balances hadn't been moved out to the proper funds and gone through the normal clearing process with turnover in the treasury department. Um, so we just called that out there, the dollar amount that we saw uh, that should have been moved out to those funds specifically. Go ahead and advance the slide. All right, this is nearing the end of our presentation, but just wanna say thanks to everyone involved in this process. And, and thanks of course to uh, Ron, Kevin, uh, and, and their teams that we work with very closely throughout this process. We're, we're talking to a lot of different folks throughout the city at various bureaus, uh, but mainly with kind of the, the finance team there and, and really appreciate them hosting our team period, periodically on site during the audit process. I know as we continue to come out of COVID more and more, uh, we're getting to have that face time with our, with our clients again. And so really appreciated being able to come out on site at the Portland building uh, periodically throughout our audit. So appreciate that. Go ahead and advance the slide. All right, I think that's everything that we had. So I'll pause there and happy to answer any questions that all of you may have. Very good, excellent. Colleagues, any questions? Keelan, we don't have any testimony on this. Is that correct? That's correct. Very good. Uh, well, I certainly appreciate this report. I, I want to thank Auditor Reddy and I want to thank the auditor's team and I want to thank our private sector partners in all of this. Uh, it's very difficult, tedious work. What we see is just the very, very final product that, again, represents many, many, many hours of very hard work. And I'm always grateful when we get to the end of this process and we're able to see that on the whole, things are 
very solid. And I want to thank all of our city employees who work every day to make sure that it stays that way. Thank you so much. Colleagues, anything else? Very good. Thank you, Auditor. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Our next item is item 1015. This is a non-emergency ordinance. Mayor, this item is scheduled to start at 3 p.m. We're a little bit early. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay, why don't we take a 10-minute recess? And before we, we unplug the mics here, for those of you who are interested in testifying, and I understand we have several dozen people signed up to testify on this item, please uh, ensure that your remarks are two minutes or less. We will be enforcing that. Thank you. Uh, we're in recess until 3 p.m.
life. Adopt new supporting documents to Portland Comprehensive Plan related to the housing needs analysis and buildable land inventory to address future housing needs, access to affordable housing, and development capacity. And just a reminder, uh, we have quite a few people signed up to testify on this, so please have your talking points be two minutes or less for testimony because we want to make sure we hear from everybody who'd like to be heard from today. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. I'm excited to bring forward to Council these updates to the city's comprehensive plan and to continue the discussion on one of the most important issues facing Portland, housing affordability. As we all know, one of the most basic ways to address housing affordability is to produce more housing, more housing of all types and all sizes, and housing that meets different needs at different points in our life. And as we, as we look to do what we can to build more housing, it's helpful and important to have a clear understanding of where we are and where we're headed. And what we have in front of us today are essentially two reports on data related to housing, each of which plays an important role in informing the city's potential future actions and decisions. The housing needs analysis and the buildable land inventory provide baseline information about current housing conditions, future needs, and where we have the opportunity to grow. These documents will help inform future policy decisions, starting with the upcoming housing production strategy that we'll learn more about today. At our July work session on housing production, I believe one of my colleagues asked, what does success look like? And I think success is expanding housing choice and opportunities in neighborhoods throughout the city, working together with regional, state, and federal partners and in collaboration with the private sector, which is the predominant builder of housing. It is a big challenge that is shared by all growing West Coast cities. Understanding the housing need and how much capacity the city zoning has to accommodate housing is an important first step in addressing our needs. The housing production strategy, which you will learn a little bit more about today as a part of an additional information briefing, is an important next step in the city's efforts to address housing needs. Once it's adopted by council next year, it will serve as an action plan identifying the multifaceted strategies that the city can pursue to further its ongoing work to remove barriers to and to support the production of housing for all income levels. As a reminder, the housing production strategy, a new state requirement is not before city council today, but we will have it ready for council in late summer of next year. So now I'll like, I will turn it over to Patricia Diefenderfer and her staff from BPS to lead us through the, the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Commissioner Rubio. Hello, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm actually gonna hand it over to Tom Armstrong, our supervising planner for this project, who will walk us through the beginning, the early parts of this presentation, and then I'll take over after a little bit. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Tom Armstrong. I'm a supervising planner at BPS, and my team has um, put together a lot of the information that you see today in terms of the housing needs analysis and the buildable land inventory. Um, as Commissioner Rubio said um, today <clears throat> before you, uh, we'll provide the basics on the um, housing needs analysis, um, which which is the um, focus of today's hearing, um, and it is an ordinance, a land use action to adopt a new housing needs analysis and a new residential buildable land inventory. And then secondly, because it's hard to talk about housing needs without talking about the strategies to address those needs, we're joined today by our Bureau partners and we'll give council a preview of the upcoming housing production strategy work. Um, and again, this isn't necessarily for action by council right now, um, but it gives you a, 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 a preview, a look about the work that we're gonna be doing in early 2024 to bring back to you. Um, you know, as as we said, and as is in the ordinance, the, the specific action before council 
is to repeal the 2009 housing needs analysis, which we, we did as part of the, the 2035 comprehensive plan update and to adopt the 2045 housing needs analysis. And then at the same time to repeal the residential portions of the 2015 buildable lands inventory and to update that and adopt um, the 2023 residential uh, buildable land inventory. Um, because this is a, a land use um, decision by council, um, we have compiled the legislative record. Uh, all of the written testimony um, is being collected and, and uh, documented in the MAP app. Um, so far, we have about 30 pieces of written testimony. Um, all of the, the evidence and the supporting documents and the testimony that was before Planning Commission to get us to this point is uh, located in the, um, the ordinance file on the auditor's web website in the e-file system. So that information is also available for council and the public to, to review. So what is a, a, a housing needs analysis? Um, this starts, this is a state um, mandated uh, required analysis that all cities ha have to go through um, under uh, statewide planning goal 10, um, we need to show or ensure that we have enough zoning capacity to accommodate our housing needs over the next 20 years. Um, the new uh, This needs analysis and, and based on changes that the state legislature have made over the last few years, these housing needs analysis need to be updated every six years. So this is gonna start a cycle um, where the city updates this analysis every six years. And it is, as I said before, it is a uh, supporting document to the comprehensive plan that gets adopted by ordinance um, by the council, um, which is what, what we were be, will be doing here today. Um, what it means to be an or, a, a, a supporting document um, to the comprehensive plan is that we have a number of these documents, the buildable land inventory, the economic opportunities analysis, the natural resource inventory, public facility plans that, that are really foundational documents that inform the policy decisions that inform changes to the zoning map or the zoning code, um, but they but they are are document sort of existing conditions and and expected future conditions. What we're doing here today is is amending those supporting documents. They're going to inform future policy decisions, but we're not making any policy decisions right now as part of as part of this ordinance work. So as we've talked about, the, the housing needs analysis and, and the housing production strategy are two related documents. Um, we're really focused on the um, needs analysis and the buildable land inventory here today. We, as you will see, we based that work on both a study of existing conditions and and how those how the populate Portland's population and housing conditions have been changing, especially over the last um, 10, 11 years. We use that information to um, inform our housing forecast, what that proje projected need will be in the future. And it's at the same time we use those development trends, um, to inform our buildable land in inventory. And we combine those two into what's called a housing capacity analysis that really shows us you know, where we are in terms of, of needed housing in the future. Um, as you will see, this housing capacity analysis for most other cities in Oregon, most especially outside the metro region, they use this information to inform um, sort of their future urban growth boundary amendments. 
that's not really a decision that that Portland needs to make. That's that that's done on a regional basis by Metro. We use it to inform, uh, as you will see in, in this presentation, what kind of housing do we need? What kind of um, zoning um, changes, uh, incentives, programs can we use uh, to support the production of particular kind of needed housing? Um, and so in that sense, our, our capacity analysis, just comparing where we have room to grow, what that future need is, is really a, a, a first basic step for Portland. And it and it really gets into the production strategy, which which becomes, um, you know, the 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 deeper dive in the policy um, end of things. So <clears throat> we start with a housing forecast. This is the foundation um, for our work. Uh, you know, despite. Uh, losing population in 21 and 22, we are still planning for long-term growth. Um, the the we were preliminary numbers for 23 shows us turning that around and that we're starting to grow again. The region is still planning for growth. The state is still planning for growth. We're planning for growth. Um, this is a long-term forecast. We're planning for recovery and and future growth. Um, this. Household forecast is based on the uh, 2019 Metro Regional forecast um, for about 97,000 new households between 2021 and 2045. Uh, to that, we add a couple of factors, one to account for um, vacant uh, housing units. Um, and then the other is, is for second home replacements, uh, vacation homes. Um, we want to we want to accommodate uh, for that uh, for for vacation rentals to make sure again we have enough uh, housing for our population. That gets us to a, a needed housing units of about one hundred and six thousand units. At the same time, you know we're looking ahead. The in in twenty twenty three, the state legislature uh, passed new housing legislation. Um, for the Oregon housing needs analysis um, that really is going to do things a little bit differently. And so we've added into this forecast um, early adoption of, of that methodology to account for what is called underproduction, which begins to, to look back and look at the number of households that have been created and how that compares to um, the number of housing units that have been produced. And what we've seen over time is a lack of uh, housing production, keeping up with population growth or keeping up with new household formations. And so we've added, again, we've added a factor here of about 9,000 additional units to make up for that underproduction. The other um, new requirement is for um, explicitly uh, accounting for um, housing our houseless population. Uh, under the past regulatory state regulations requirements, um, you know, housing houseless has been about shelter, emergency shelter. Um, and, and now there's a more explicit direction to include that the, the actual permanent housing units into our forecast, to, which it basically says, you know, making sure our zoning accommodates, has enough room to accommodate um, housing all of our, our, our houseless population. So when we factor those in, that, that number gets us to about 120,000 new housing units by 2045. And that, that's an annual production target of about 5,200 units per year which, as you will see later in this presentation, is on par with about what we've been producing over the last 10 years. The other housing target that we've come up with, it really accelerates um, the, the historic underproduction and the housing for the houseless um, to really align ourselves with Governor, Totec, Governor Kotex um, statewide housing production strategy, which um, really then puts us at that catch-up target 
of about 55,000 new units by 2032. That raises that annual production target to about 6,000 units per year. Um, and and we're, that's where we really start to, again, look at this production strategy, look at our um, stretch goals, um, and and really has been informing some of the work that we've we've been doing to per, per boost housing production overall. In addition to just looking at overall um, housing production, we also have to look at a number of different factors, uh, de different demographic factors. The state has a start with housing affordability. Um, you know, we need to uh, produce housing for a number of different income levels. Um, particularly, we are focused on housing affordability for lower income Portland householders. Um, those earning less than 80% than of the area median income, which is a household earning Sixty-three to $90,000 a year, depending on, on the household size. Um, that currently makes up about 47% um, of the, the uh, Portland households today. When you factor in the, uh, the underproduction and the housing for the homeless, that boosts our, our future need to about 63,000 units or about 53% of the future housing growth um, really needs to be focused on this lower income uh, 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 category. We also in the housing needs analysis look at, at needs for other types of households um, in characteristics. Um, you know, we know we, we, we've seen families um, with children have been de in decline. Currently, they make up about 23% of Portland households. So if we wanna maintain that level of, of diversity, we need to be looking at, at producing 28,000 units, larger units with more than two, two bedrooms, two or more bedrooms. Um, we also know we have an, um, an aging population. And so we need to look at what are we doing to enable the development of housings that, that are suitable for elders. Um, we, we know we have a, a population that um, has uh, increasingly people with um, disabilities. And so we need to look at accessible housing. There's some, there's some overlap here, some intersectionality between the needs. Um, but then we also also need to look at, we've, we've seen, Home ownership rates decline, primarily because we've been um, primarily uh, developing mostly rental housing. Um, but we need to, so we need to focus on home ownership and what are strategies we can do to to boost home ownership um, and and those needs. So the forecast is really about the demand side of, of the equation and the buildable land inventory is, is really about the supply side. Um, you know, where do we have, what is the development capacity within the city um, as, and, and that really is what, is, what is the likely or expected number of new dwelling units that can be accommodated under the existing zoning? Um, so we look look at the existing zoning, the existing plans. Um, we look at at current development trends to try and estimate where is that de development potential. Um, we factor in available infrastructure. We factor in physical constraints like steep slopes or wetlands, um, brownfields, um, to really get at an estimate of 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 where we have capacity to grow. Um, this is um, again based on our, our uh, you know comprehensive plan growth strategy to grow in centers and corridors. Um, we have uh, you know the the this has been a focus of our comprehensive plan since 1980 to focus growth in our our higher density 
transit oriented, bike oriented, pedestrian friendly, um, transit streets and, and neighborhood business districts. And, and we're doing that. Um, you know, as you, you can see a, a portrayal of that on the right here, um, where our density is, our, our development capacity is located. Um, we have room for about 237,000 additional housing units. Um, most of that is, is located in our centers and corridors and especially the central city. The central city accounts for about um, uh, almost 30% of our future development capacity. Um, and so that's um, really the, the focus um, shows the importance of, of uh, boosting, uh, producing housing in the central city as a key to our, our, our future um, growth plan. At the same time, we do have um, development capacity spread across the city in all districts in the city. Um, it, it really is aligned and, and matches with where we expect growth um, when we when we look back 20 years, where do we where has growth occurred in the city and and projecting that out 20 years into the future, we're in pretty good alignment in terms of that distri distribution of capacity and being able to accommodate that future growth. We also look at, you know, what kinds of housing types are we um, uh, uh, enabling uh, in terms of future growth and how does that align with expected development? Again, most of our, 90% of our um, future growth capacity is in our multi-dwelling and mixed-use zoning. And so what you see here is that is that sort of bias towards those multi-dwelling housing types. Um, and, and again, there's some variation in there from wood frame construction, the, the two to four story buildings all the way up to the, the steel and concrete high rise towers we see in the central city. And so again, back to sort of the, the production, what is the challenge ahead for us? Um, this is a chart that shows our, the number of new units permitted each year going back to the year 2000. This is a chart we showed back in the July um, work session on, on housing. Um, the, the pink dashed line here um, really shows that 5,200 um, unit annual target. It, it, it's achievable. It's something that we've done in the past. It's, it's a challenge right now under current economic conditions. Um, and, and it, you know, we're going to have to continue to work harder to reach that 6,000 unit production level here, um, especially um, with today's economic conditions. Um, but really what the housing needs analysis shows and, and what the buildable land in inventory shows is that overall, we can do this. We can meet our, our future housing needs. And, and as with all things, the devil is in the details and we need to, to, to go to that next level and think about the different types of housing and, and how we, what other programs and strategies um, we can do to support that production strategies. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over um, to Patricia to talk, to give you a preview on the, the future housing production strategy work. Thanks so much, Tom. Uh, again, just for the record, Patricia Defender for Chief Planner here at BPS. So now we are going to shift to a preview of the housing production strategy. As you heard, the housing needs analysis is about the numbers and fulfilling the basic statewide planning goal uh, 10 requirement to analyze um, and make a determination as to whether the city has sufficient development capacity to accommodate expected growth. So at a very basic level, as you heard, the answer is yes. Uh, the city does have the capacity to meet the, that housing demand. However, in order to meet the overall housing demand, uh, the production and the diversity of housing needs, the city, there are a number of actions the city can take and uh, is likely to take in the future to influence the production of housing. So this is where the housing production strategy comes in. So this next component of the presentation is about what we're calling the housing production strategy framework. Um, it is not 
as we noted before, it's not before Council for Action currently, but it is a preview of future work uh, that will be coming to the Council in the late summer of next year. So next slide, please, Tom. So the housing production strategy, as was mentioned, is a new state requirement uh, to make cities more accountable for not just doing the basic planning, but to take action to support housing production. A, pr a housing production strategy is a list of specific actions the city will undertake to promote development to address the identified housing need. Portland is already doing a lot to pr promote housing production. You will hear about some of our re recent efforts in some future slides. This production strategy is an opportunity to assess what we are doing, what we could do better, and what new initiatives we might need to undertake. The actions, as you can see on the, on the slide here, um, that the city can take span a number of broad categories um, and include actions to reduce uh, re regulatory barriers and encourage housing production, which could include zoning and other code changes, could include incentives, which could also be financial incentives such as tax exemptions and uh, fee or SDC waivers or exemptions, for example, and public funding for affordable housing, as well as efforts to streamline development, uh, the development review process and the permitting process. The categories you see on this slide are recognition that a wide range of strategies and approaches are necessary to address the housing production and housing affordability challenges facing the city. There will be a focus um, on meeting the needs of, of, of the, the households that were mentioned by Tom, low-income households, uh, communities of color, people with disabilities, and other state and federal protected classes. So again, this preview um, is a work in progress. What we're presenting today are early high-level concepts. Staff will be working over the next many months to further develop these and other strategies through continued internal and agency coordination and community and stakeholder engagement. Next slide, please. So council uh, may recall seeing this slide back in the July housing work session as well. We just wanted uh, to put this here as a reminder. The city has different tools and levers it can apply to encourage development of housing at different income levels. Uh, you can see from the chart here for the lowest income level, for the lowest income housing units, the primary tools are funding, which typically come from housing bonds and tax increment financing funds that are set aside for affordable housing. The city also has the ability to offer incentives that can encourage the production of affordable housing at various income levels, including middle income housing. They can include tax exemptions, zoning bonuses, uh, tax increment financing and loans and uh, permit priority for affordable housing. The regulations the city adopts that apply to housing development generally influences production of housing at all income levels. Some examples of this include zoning and other development code regulations, SDC fees and requirements, and infrastructure requirements placed on development. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of information on this slide. Um, the, not going to go over everything on this slide. The main purpose of this slide is to communicate that the city has been working to increase housing production and address housing needs for many years and has undertaken many projects to advance a variety of housing goals. Just to highlight a few notable ones, um, for example, the affordable housing projects that have been constructed with funding from city and Metro housing bonds, regulatory changes such as the residential infill project, which updated zoning regulations to allow four plexes and six plexes in single dwelling zoning districts, and which encouraged the development of middle housing and expands housing or home ownership opportunities is an example, um, the shelter to housing continuum projects, which allowed shelters and permanent supportive housing in more zoning districts in the city to accommodate housing at the lowest income levels is another example. Um, also ongoing efforts to improve and uh, permitting and process, sorry, the permitting process and encourage development by giving priority review to affordable housing projects, allowing for the deferral of SDCs um, and the recent ordinance related to seismic requirements for office to housing conversions are other examples of the work that the city has been doing. Next slide, please. So this slide um, shows that the city, the city is not waiting to finish the uh, housing production strategy to take action. There are many efforts that are in the works currently 
even as staff are working on the housing production strategy. So on this slide, you can see a list of these actions and they're organized um, by what types of units by income level that they largely help to facilitate. So just to highlight a couple of examples here, um, creating an inventory of public lands that could be developed with affordable housing is an action that's ongoing. Code and regulatory changes that facilitate production, streamline regulations and process and re reduce conflict such as the regulatory improvement code amendment package or recap and updates to the inclusionary housing regulations and the housing regulatory relief project are a few of the uh, strategies or efforts that are going on right now. And these will be described in more detail in subsequent um, slides. So also as previously noted, the housing production strategy, of course, is still a work in progress. The next several slides will, will outline potential future actions that the city might take to advance housing production at all different income levels. Um, these are preliminary ideas that are still being further developed um, and represent some of the potential future actions. Staff from multiple bureaus are currently working together to identify and refine a broad range of actions. Um, so the next several slides, I would like to invite um, staff from partner bureaus to present the next couple of slides, uh, which will highlight some of the potential actions by the different affordability levels. Next slide, please, Tom. I believe thank that, you. yeah, Jill Chen. Thank you, Jill. Appreciate it. Thank you, Patricia. Just for the record, I'm Jill Chen. I'm Housing Investments and Portfolio Preservation Manager at the Portland Housing Bureau. And I wanna thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, for the opportunity to provide a peek at potential affordable housing strategies for which we will be returning in 2024 with more details. Our potential strategies are under three categories focused on funding, incentive, and other tools. Uh, for funding, the first is the need to find a replacement for the Portland and Metro housing bonds. These bonds were critical for the increased affordable housing production over the past five years. This represents over $100 million in investments by the city in affordable housing. The second is the need to create new tax increment finance districts. PHB receives 45% of all tax increment finance resources for affordable housing. Historically, this is the largest source of funding for affordable housing. We know that Central City and East Portland TIF plans will be presented sometime in mid-2024, and we're hopeful that you will look positively to it. However, we want to ensure that substantial funding for development is not immediate, so any projects to be funded are still a few years out. In terms of the next funding source, we would like to make sure that we as a city are leveraging other resources. So the state legislature passed an unprecedented 1 billion plus for housing in the latest budget biennium. And we're seeking to leverage those resources with available PHB funds. Um, and also working with, we will continue working with federal and county governments to align our resources. Um, so that's sort of the package of funding. In terms of expanding incentives, um, we're looking first to expand incentives offered through inclusionary housing. A package is forthcoming in early January of 2024. And this is based on the work that PHB has conducted under the inclusionary housing recalibration study. And we're moving forward with the work group's recommendations. At the core is the expansion of deeper property tax exemptions outside of the central city. We are offering to brief your offices and happy to set those meetings up. Um, in addition to the in incentives, we're also looking at zoning changes and creative zoning changes that might support affordable housing, especially up zoning as appropriate. In terms of other tools, as Patricia mentioned, we have already um, started the work and will continue the work on a public lands inventory and a prioritizing sites that not 
are developable and suitable uh, for development, but also um, have a strong financing feasibility for, com for completion. But And last but not least, we're looking to support our mission-aligned organizations interested in building affordable housing on land they own. PHB has worked with donated land and church-owned land, and we're greatly appreciative of those partnerships. And we're always looking for ways to support others as part of the solutions. As Patricia mentioned, this is just an initial list of strategies with more to come. So, and without further ado, I'll pass it over to my colleague, um, Lisa Boff, to talk about middle income housing. Next slide. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. For the record, I'm Lisa Abwa. I'm the Director of Development and Investment with Prosper Portland, and I use she, her pronouns. And as Jill and Patricia mentioned, I'm here to share a high-level summary of some of our early thinking regarding potential strategies to support delivering on the 8,600 units of middle-income units that are needed by Portland householders making between 80 and 100% median, or 120% median family income. I just wanted to flag that this is a key priority, both as we think about housing production, but also as we think about it from an economic development perspective, as identified in Advance Portland, where middle income housing really helps respond to challenges that we're seeing in our central city from diversity of uses or along our commercial corridors, particularly for those areas uh, where economic health and resilience was really disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and where we think middle income as well as affordable housing can be a key tool for the city to implement. So similar to Jill, we have three buckets. It's financing tools, incentive programs, and zoning changes. Under financing tools, I just wanted to highlight um, with limited, very limited federal and tax credit resources available for middle-income housing, expanding local and state financing tools really becomes critical. And um, in as I think about that, kind of the opportunity to partner with the state and their increased commitment and energy regarding middle income becomes key. And as Jill mentioned, there is a strong commitment that we are seeing coming from the state, both around affordable as well as middle income units. Prosper and the city are excited to have the state as a partner and appreciative that there's so much work going on at that level. And as part of our TIF exploration processes from East Portland to the Central City, as directed by Council, we're actually hearing about the importance of accessible middle income housing, as well as affordable housing to community on a daily basis. In fact, we just heard this again yesterday at an East Portland Steering Committee and Working Group Joint Make Meeting, where they, meant they constantly mentioned both affordable housing as critical to stabilizing community, as well as middle income home ownership and rental uh, projects. And we expect that any um, TIF plan proposals that come forward to Council over the next year, um, resulting from the exploration processes, I would expect to see this as a potential use on the project list across Central City and East Portland. Within the incentive programs, in addition to increasing direct financial uh, availability, there are other incentive tools the city can offer to help support middle income housing. That's things like the Home Buyer Opportunity Limited, limited Tax Exemption Program, otherwise um, known as HOLTI, which offers a 10-year tax abatement or exemption on homeownership units. And then within this category, we also wanted to acknowledge that there is a request that has come forward to council regarding the expansion of the SDC waiver. Today, SDC exemptions are available to rental projects affordable to housing, households earning 60% or less, and then for home ownership projects for folks um, earning 100% or less of median family income. So SDCs are an important tool, but they're also critical. We also know that they're critical to our infrastructure bureau partners being able to deliver on streets, transportation, open space, sewer and stormwater capacity. And we acknowledge that there are trade-offs for council considerations in this category. And last but not least, under zoning, we see strong alignment between the residential infill project and supporting middle-income housing by expanding the types of housing available in our residential neighborhoods particularly seeing the potential for infill housing in places where the market is potentially actually naturally performing at middle income levels, i.e. at 80%, at 100% median family income, such as in East Portland, where we have a moment to think creatively about the tools we have as a city to stabilize community through new middle income housing development, including through infill. And with that, I think I am handing it back to Patricia. Yes, thank you so much, Lisa. All right, so we're almost, uh, we just have a few more slides. Um, in this next slide, we just wanted to highlight some potential near-term regulatory changes that affect housing at all income levels. Um, so 
one of the things that council will be seeing very soon is the housing regulatory relief project, which will be coming to council in January of uh, 2024. This project proposes a package of zoning code amendments that grant temporary relief from select development regulations and procedures for a period of five years to facilitate housing development at all income levels. Adoption of updates to the inclusionary housing regulations, as uh, Jill mentioned, that expand the inclusionary housing incentives to more projects is also a piece of legislation that will be before council in January of 2024. Another near-term future project um, is a staff evaluation, and this is, was alluded to in some of the other uh, slides, but a staff evaluation of the zoning incentives and bonuses across zoning districts to optimize not just the number of housing units produced, but to encourage production of diverse housing types, including accessible units and family size units. Um, as it relates to permitting improvements, um, as we know, there's a permitting improvement project that is ongoing and will continue around implementing the single permit authority to improve decision-making and ensure transparency and consistency in outcomes in the, in the development review process improving the customer experience through staff training and customer service surveys, among other approaches, um, establishing permit timelines and doing ongoing monitoring to um, for performance uh, to meet those timelines, implementing regulatory and process improvements through ongoing review of different business processes and improving cross bureau policy coordination. Other strategies um, that our potential actions um, also include conducting an analysis of an infrastructure capacity in the inner east geography of the city to inform potential future expansions of multi-dwelling zoning in, in that area. There's been several uh, written comments. You've received uh, written testimony related to this topic, and you're likely to hear public testimony about this um, in the upcoming hearing. Also analyzing barriers to condominium development, which are necessary um, or important to increasing home ownership opportunities and continuing to evaluate additional ways in which to facilitate the conversion and reuse of, of uh, central city office buildings for housing. Next slide, please. So now I um, wanna just kind of uh, speak to the outreach and the engagement that's going on related to uh, the housing production strategy. So. Outreach and engagement on this on the housing production strategy has been ongoing for some time and, and will continue. In the first phase, the focus of the first phase was to introduce the project uh, to different stakeholders and to uh, seek feedback on needs and gather uh, some ideas about the, what, what strategies the city should pursue. That outreach has been both um, within, uh, among the city and multi-bureau teams through technical advisory committees as well as outreach to key stakeholders, external um, and uh, stakeholders and community groups. In phase two of the outreach, um, the, it, the purpose will be to share the draft strategies and get feedback on prioritization, uh, very much kind of tapping into the same uh, groups and um, existing technical advisory groups for that, as well as doing more broad citywide outreach through survey and open house and also with the focus on uh, BIPOC focus groups and community meetings. And then phase three, as we approach um, bringing the, this housing production strategy back to city council, we will be um, in making modifications as needed to the, the strategies and publishing the housing production strategy. And that will go to the planning commission for hearing and recommendation, and ultimately to city council for hearing and recommendation. Um, next slide, please. So very close to recapping here. So just last, uh, second to last slide, these are the next steps just to recap that um, council can expect. So this housing needs analysis, as we mentioned, is what's before council right now for adoption. Uh, state requirements do require that the housing needs analysis be, and the, and the buildable lands inventory that supports it be adopted by the end of the year. So uh, looking for council action on that. The next at the next meeting, uh, which is scheduled for December 13th, uh, January of 2024, the council will see a couple of the um, the projects that we mentioned that are the near term actions, which include the amendments to the inclusionary housing regulations to expand exemptions and then the housing regulatory relief project. 
just noting here, again, recapping the um, outreach that's being conducted on the housing production strategy to finalize the those strategies in that document. And then with the intention of bringing the housing production strategy to council for adoption in the summer of 2024. Next slide, please. And I believe this is the last slide, just to recap to remind uh, council what the action before council is today and currently. The Planning Commission on October 24th did recommend unanimously that the City Council uh, both uh, take these actions, repeal the 2009 housing needs analysis and adopt the 2045 housing needs analysis and similarly repeal the residential portions of the 2015 buildable lands inventory and adopt the updated 2023 building buildable lands inventory. And with that, I think that completes our presentation. Thank you so much. We're happy to answer any questions you might have. Very good. Colleagues, before we get into public testimony, does anybody have any questions? Keelan, how many folks do we have signed up? We have 32 people signed up. Very good. Two minutes each. Name for the record. Keelan will call the names and please be very much on point as we will mute you at two minutes because we want to make sure we hear testimony from everybody who'd like to be heard today. Thank you. First up, we have... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Keelan, one, one point of order. I, I apologize for interrupting. Just to remind people, um, this is a first reading, so the council will not actually be voting today. We will just be hearing public testimony today then we'll close the record at the end of this. So if you're hanging on, uh, expecting a council vote, I just want to let people know that that doesn't happen at this part of the process. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. First up, we have Matt Tuckerbaum. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, thank you so much for taking time to listen to input on the housing needs analysis today. My name is Matt Tuckerbaum. I am the board a board member at Portland Neighbors Welcome. And I'm excited to speak on behalf of our organization today. We would like to thank the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for their thorough work on this report. We've reviewed it closely and want to highlight a few important points beyond the headlines. First, as you noted in the HA work session last summer, Mayor Wheeler, our current zoning capacity on its own would continue our current housing trajectory, which means continuation of our housing crisis and suppressed production. Second, our zone capacity is not strategically located. Only 33% is in amenity rich, high opportunity neighborhoods, and 42% is in areas with high economic vulnerability. Third, Black, Native American, and Latino Portlanders making the average income for their demographic are unable to afford a home anywhere within city limits. Fourth, we need to boost housing production at all income levels, and we cannot rely solely on government funded construction to maximize production. As the city's attention turns to creating a new housing production strategy, we hope you'll use this opportunity to address these important points by supporting the production of many more homes throughout our high opportunity neighborhoods so that Portland has more abundant and affordable housing options for everyone. Our ask today is for council to support this approach and to direct BPS to formally, formally include a project to upzone the inner east side from 12th out to 60th, from Fremont down to Powell in the housing production strategy. We're calling this initiative an Inner East Side for All, and our goal is to re-legalize multi-story mixed-use buildings, four floors and corner stores throughout the Inner East Side. Portland Neighbors Welcome has formed a broad coalition of partners who support this initiative. You'll hear from some of them today, and you can see the work we've done to demonstrate the feasibility and popularity of this idea in our written testimony. We'll help you use, we hope you will use the opportunity presented by the housing production strategy to work towards a more livable Portland. Thanks for your time. Up, we have Kyle Johnson. Hello, Mayor and Councilors. My name is Kyle Johnson, and I am here today to talk about why approving the housing needs analysis and including four floors and corner stores throughout the inner east side will create a more bike friendly city. Well, I'm the vice chair of Bike Loud, which has signed on to the letter of support for this proposal. I'm speaking to you today as the founder of Go By Bike, which started and runs the largest bike ballet in North America. In 13 years of operation, we have safely and securely parked over 700,000 bikes at those who have shorter commutes. 
Allowing more people to live closer to where they need to go allows for more trips that are ideal by bike. By approving these changes, we'll be giving those future residents the option to move around by bike. In the Netherlands, which has a complete network of protected bike infrastructure, we see that the number of people who are willing to ride a bike to their destination uh, uh, at trips that are around 15 minutes away by bike. Our goal as a city needs to be to create more trips that are 15 minutes away by bike and make sure that there is safe infrastructure along the way. When you look at where our future housing stock can currently be located, too much of it is in the periphery of Portland where we do not have good transportation options. When we concentrate our future housing out there, we are making it much harder for those residents to be able to ride by bike. To reach our climate and transportation goals, we need to get to 25% of all trips made by bike. The housing potential that will be unlocked by these changes will make it much easier for future neighbors to help us meet those goals. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Michael Anderson. Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners, my name is Michael Anderson. I'm a senior housing researcher with Sightline Institute. We're a regional sustainability think tank. Sightline's housing program is built on the fact that when people choose to live closer to each other, they voluntarily cut their energy use roughly in half. But energy use is just one of many things at stake in this housing needs analysis. That's why I'm here today with others to say, as the city moves from this housing needs analysis into its 2045 housing production strategy, it should include a project to include a broad re-legalization of small scale apartment buildings throughout Portland's closer in neighborhoods. Rather than duplicate others, I'll just make one quick point today about displacement. If you turn to page 64 of the HNA, you'll see this startling fact. In the central city, more than half of the unregulated affordable homes in Portland, that's inexpensive older plexes and apartments, sit in a fairly small ring of neighborhoods around the central city, no further east than 60th Avenue. The city designates these as high opportunity neighborhoods. New apartments were banned from much of this area in the 1980s, though the apartments that had been built by then are still in apartment zones, surrounded by this lower density zoning. Next time demand rises for this area, what's gonna to happen to the people in those older unregulated affordable apartments? Rent hikes, rent evictions, displacement. But by allowing apartments throughout the rest of these walkable inner neighborhoods, Portland would open an economic steam valve to protect against this scenario. New demand could result not in displacement, but in new construction and a bigger tax base. As you'll hear today from affordable developers, this change would accelerate Portland's production of below market homes while holding market prices lower. This change would let all our inner neighborhoods evolve the same way Buckman and Boys in the Northwest District were once allowed to. It would diversify neighborhoods economically, cut energy use, boost economic growth, and reduce dependence on cars. We urge you to include a project like this in the upcoming HPS. Thanks. Next up, we have Zachary Lesher. Thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Zach Lesher. I'm a renter in Buckman, and I'm here to support Portland Neighbors Welcome's call to upzone the inner east side for four floors and corner stores. I'm testifying today because I love the inner east side. It is filled with parks and restaurants and allows me to live car free due to its many frequent bus lines and wonderful neighborhood greenways that make biking easy and safe. I want more people to be able to call the inner east side home and not just people who can afford to buy a single family home. I want to see an inner east side where affordable apartments aren't only limited to being built along dangerous roads in a high crash network, but can be built anywhere, mixed in with other homes to create an even more diverse, vibrant community than we already have, with the new housing supporting new neighborhood businesses that wouldn't be possible without being within an easy walk of so many residents. As you listen to other testimony on this proposal, I hope you will see that this change is popular and that people have so many different and varied reasons for supporting it. Therefore, I would add, like to ask that the inner east side for all proposal be included as a strategy in the housing production strategy. Thank you. Next up, we have Dave Petacolas. Hello, uh, my name is Dave Petacola, and I'm a homeowner in North Portland. I moved to this city years ago and quickly fell in love with it but I have nevertheless grown increasingly concerned over how many decent and hardworking people cannot afford housing in this city where they work and live. But as a volunteer for Portland Neighbors Welcome, I have also learned that there are practical, reasonable, and economically beneficial steps we can take. We can update our zoning rules to allow a more expansive vision of growth and possibility for this city. 
I know that Portland has already taken some steps in this direction, and I am grateful for the work the council has done. Whenever I see new housing going up in my Portland neighborhood, I am excited and optimistic that a more inclusive and accessible city is within our grasp. Please continue your good work by approving the housing needs analysis. It does show that the status quo is not enough, and we must do still more to support growth and housing formation. As part of doing more, please also support the inner, inner east side for all plan as part of the housing production strategy so that high opportunity areas of the city can be prioritized for new construction. Thank you, Mayor and members of the Council for listening to my testimony. Next up, we have Kevin Cronin. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Wheeler, members of the Portland City Council. My name is Kevin Cronin. I'm here representing Housing Oregon as their Director of Policy and Advocacy. Thank you so much time uh, today for taking time to listen to all the testimony. At Housing Oregon, we are a collective voice for nonprofits dedicated to community development and equitable housing solutions. Our members span across community development corporations, public housing authorities, and homeless service providers working tirelessly to create sustainable communities and provide affordable housing in Oregon. Today, I'm here in uh, support of the item 15 in support of up, up zoning the inner east side. Um, up, up zoning of the inner east side is crucial for. Bye -bye. Thank you. Uh, for expanding the locations where affordable housing projects are financially feasible. By increasing the number of parcels where such projects can be developed, we enable more effective use of public funds, ensuring that they yield maximum impact in areas that are rich with opportunities. So I urge you as our city's leaders to support this um, and the housing needs analysis and incorporate the upzoning uh, to the energy side as a key element in the housing production strategy. Thank you so much for considering this and have a great day. Next up, we have Sarah Radcliffe. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and City Commissioners. My name is Sarah Radcliffe, and I am the Director of Government Relations for Habitat for Humanity, Portland Region. At Habitat, we see firsthand the need for affordable family-sized homes throughout Portland. Habitat Portland Region receives between 800 to 1,000 applications for every 60 affordable homes that we build. Over 80% of our home buyers are households of color, and many of those families were severely rent burdened before accessing an affordable mortgage. Lack of affordability causes frequent moves, homelessness, foregoing other basic needs, and family stress, all of which leads to negative outcomes for kids. Allowing a mix of housing types in convenient, high opportunity areas with strong schools is one significant step that our city can take. And that's why we support upzoning the inner east side to create more housing access in this resource rich area. I also want to note that densification and home ownership can be complementary land use strategies. Affordable family sized homes for sale can come in the form of four story condominium buildings. And if we pair density with the community land trust model, we can preserve a slice of the inner east side for diverse households today and for generations into the future. Thank you. Next up, we have Doug Plotz. Hello, um, my name is Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. My name is Doug Klotz. I am a member of Portland Neighbors Welcome and my wife and I are homeowners in Southeast Portland at 35th and Harrison. We support Portland Neighbors Welcome's plan for an inner east side for all, which will bring more housing to our well-served high opportunity neighborhood. Housing with four or more stories should be possible on all streets, not just arterials. We live four blocks from an arterial and already there are uh, as an older 18 unit building and several threeplexes there. Uh, we are able to walk and bike to work, to shop and for healthcare and we welcome new homes which will allow more people to share our neighborhood. Um, BPS tells us that while Portland indeed has enough capacity for its zoning needs, much of that capacity is in, pla is in places like East Portland, where new housing would bring a high risk of displacement for the low-income residents there. On the other hand, the inner east side plan would shift housing growth 
to the inner east side. This upzoning will allow more uh, land costs to be split between many apartment homes, making more and less expensive housing feasible. This new housing will be close in, will avoid displacement, and will reduce pressure on East Portland, stabilizing prices there. I urge you to direct BPS to include this plan in the housing production strategy, which they will be working on in the coming months. Thank you. Next up, we have Zachary Lauritsen. Hello, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Zachary Lauritsen. I'm com Looks like Zachary may have dropped off. Oh, here we go. Back and better than ever. Here we go. Uh, I don't know what you heard. It did a little funky thing there. So Zachary Lauritsen, Oregon Walks, we're a pedestrian advocacy organization. Um, I just want to give a plug for walking here uh, and with regard to this uh, measure one or 1015, um, which is we know that density makes walking feasible. And so the more we can have people living close to the corner store, the more we can have people living close to the park, the close to the school, close to their favorite business, close to their favorite wherever. Um, and they can get there on foot of all sorts of positive outcomes, right? So that's around physical health, mental health, being out and moving. Um, that's around safety. We actually know we have a safety crisis on our streets and we know the more people that are on the streets, which is actually counterintuitive, but the more people on the streets, uh, the safer it is for people who are on the streets. Um, and so it's also good for businesses, right? Because you have more traffic, you have people on foot popping in and, and making purchases. So um, Oregon Walks as an organization um, wholeheartedly supports denser housing and supports this um, this effort. So thank you so much. Next up, we have David Sweet. Mayor and commissioners, my name is David Sweet. And I live in the Cully neighborhood where we are trying to hold on to the rich diversity that we love. I'm here today to urge you to adopt the housing needs analysis and to include four floors and corner stores throughout the inner east side as part of the housing production strategy. For the last 53 years, I have lived mostly in the inner east side of Portland, in the Buckman, Irvington, Sabin, and Alameda neighborhoods. I've watched rents and real estate prices in those areas grow exponentially, and the former econo <clears throat> economic and ethnic diversity there disappear as a result. For the last 10 years, I have lived in Cully, Portland's most diverse neighborhood, where rising prices are also becoming a threat. A house near me that cost $400,000 10 years ago sold last week for $1.1 million. The engine driving displacement in Portland is the lack of abundant housing and particularly not enough housing in desirable, walkable, high opportunity areas like the Inner East Side. Building a lot more housing there will reduce the price escalation pressure on neighborhoods like Cully and East Portland. The first step is for the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to include four floors and corner stores on all lots across the Inner East Side in the housing production strategy. Thank you for your time. Next up, we have Jake Antlis. Hello there. Uh, hi, my name is Jake Antles, uh, Council Mayor. Thanks for having me today. I live in the Cully neighborhood uh, in Northeast Portland, across the street from David Sweet and Michael. Um, much of my life, I've lived in economically and racially segregated neighborhoods uh, with areas of single family homes kept separate from areas of apartments. The best housing I ever lived in was a shared single family house in Seattle that was in an area zone similar to the inner east side for all plan. It was the most affordable housing I ever had. I biked and walked everywhere, and I was surrounded by a mix of all types and sizes of buildings and a mix of all types of economic and ethnic backgrounds. We need more of these neighborhoods. Unfortunately, it, even if the inner east side plan were enacted uh, tomorrow, it will take decades for that to truly come to pass. Um, which brings me to my next point, which is my daughter, Thea, nine months old. She'll be 77 years old in the year 2100. 
And what will Portland look like in the year 2100, um, given that Portland is a likely hotspot for uh, migration from around the world and the country for climate change, given that we're hopefully going to keep being awesome and the weird people that we are, people will continue to move here. It's just too beautiful not to continue to be a growing region, in my opinion. We need to be planning ahead for that. We need to uh, be thinking of the future character of our cities and our neighborhoods, the, the character that my daughter, Thea, will help co-create as a 77-year-old woman in the year 2100. Um, let's be thinking of our, of our children with actions such as these. And our housing needs analysis doesn't even factor in uh, major climate migration. So something to think about. Thank you. Next up, we have Ben Robbins. Hi, um, thank you for your time today. <laughs> My name is Ben Robbins. My wife and I moved to Portland about a year ago, uh, and in the spring, I began volunteering for Portland Neighbors Welcome when I found out about the upzoning campaign. I work as a minister. Part of my job is to help people thrive and help communities thrive, and it is much easier to do that when people are able to live in thriving neighborhoods. Abundant housing makes every other issue easier to deal with. When the housing is close to transit, jobs, and streets that are full of life. And just speaking for myself, I notice that I get out more. I join in the life of the city more. I support our businesses more when I live close to the things I love. So let's allow more housing where people want to live. I support Portland Neighbors Welcome campaign to upzone all streets on the Inner East Side. So please include Inner East Side for All as a strategy in the housing production strategy. Thank you for your time and thank you for your work. Next up, we have David Benick. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, and thanks to BPS for the work that you've done. My name is David Binnig. I live in Inner Southeast Portland, and I'm also here to support the Inner East Side for All proposal to re-legalize apartments, uh, really because I want more people to have the opportunities that I did. When I moved to Portland in my 20s, I lived in an apartment uh, on a quiet street one block off of Belmont, built before the city banned them. And when my car rusted apart, I moved here from Cleveland, I could still walk to my restaurant job. Today, it would be harder for someone to do that. There's more competition for homes, and where we are adding homes, they're concentrated uh, on, by zoning onto only our busiest streets. Portland has struggled for decades to add enough homes for the people who'd like to live here and who would like to keep living here. And if we're ever going to change that, not just maintain the status quo of ongoing displacement that we've seen for decades, we need to look for opportunities to allow more homes in high opportunity areas, as we did when Portland was being built. This is also a transportation safety issue. Uh, today, my family lives one block off the Southeast Division, and I can raise my kid on a low traffic street and also walk to the hardware store or bike my kid to music class without needing a car and stay on relatively safe routes. A lot of Portland still doesn't have that safe network, and the city needs to continue the work of making streets safe throughout the city. But the other equally important thing that we can do is allow more people to live in parts of Portland, like my neighborhood, where daily needs are already accessible without a car. So I hope the council will approve the housing needs analysis and also uh, work to include as part of our housing production strategy, a project to re-legalize small apartment buildings throughout the inner east side of Portland. Thank you. Next up, we have Heidi Hart. Hi, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Heidi Hart, and I'm a renter in the Buckman neighborhood. I'm testifying to urge you to both approve the housing needs analysis and include Inner East Line for All as a strategy in the housing production strategy. Uh, I love the neighborhood I live in, and I want more people in Portland to be able to live in neighborhoods like mine. My neighborhood has complete streets, greenways, and all kinds of housing types from single family homes to large apartment buildings and everything in between. I have grocery stores, restaurants, and shops within walking distance, and I have a 10 minute bike ride and 10 minute transit ride from downtown. I live in a 10 unit apartment building on a side street and the street in front of my apartment is very low traffic. A family who lives down the street puts cones down for the kids to play in the middle of the street on nice days, which is not something that's feesible if you live on our arterial street. 
Most of the housing density in my neighborhood is historical because this area was downzoned in the 80s. My 1960s apartment building is not on our, not on an arterial and would not be able to be rebuilt today. Immediately next to me, actually I'm just right in there in the back, um, is a single family home that has been vacant for the over three years that I have been living here and it is completely falling apart. If it was redeveloped, it could only have a maximum of four units because of the zoning, which is unlikely to happen because of the high land values. The lot that is right next to me should be a no-brainer apartment building. Currently, no one lives there, and no one could live there without a monstrous amount of money spent fixing it up. We need our land use decisions and our inner neighborhoods to be creating new opportunities for people of all household configurations, ages, abilities, and incomes to live in places that enhance their well-being. We need bold changes to make that happen. Thank you. Next up, we have Summer Boslov. Uh, Keelan, could I just uh, interrupt for a sec? Are people able to see the timer? Yes. Is it is it visible? Because um, I, I feel like a lot of people are stopping at the first bell. And I just want to remind people the first bell means you have 30 seconds left. It's not. And then you'll hear a second bell when your two minutes is actually up. And I, I think people have been very succinct and to the point that I also don't want to cut people off prematurely. So the first bell is 30 seconds left. The second bell is no time left. And if you're online, you should be able to see the timer. Thank you, Mayor. Go ahead, right. Summer. Um, excuse me. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, hello, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Summer Boslow, and I'm a homeowner of over 18 years in inner Southeast Portland. And I care about vibrant, livable neighborhoods that are accessible to all income levels. With Within a five minute walk of my house, I can go grocery shopping and to restaurants, bars, and small businesses, all of which I frequently regularly. I love going out with my family and never having to get in the car. We can go see a movie, get dinner, pick up a gift for a friend at a local business and end the, the evening with dessert all on foot. I can get to work downtown on the bus or on my bike and my daughter can walk to school or ride the bus and to hang out with friends. I am grateful every day for my wonderful neighborhood, and I know that my relatively high household income makes it all possible. I want housing equity so that Portlanders at all income levels are able to live in a neighborhood like this. I wanna make Portland the best city that it can be. I love living here and I wanna to continue to, to allow others to live here and um, make it possible for new residents and, and existing residents um, to, to have good housing. To do this, we need to upzone the inner east side to allow four floors and corner stores buildings to be built across the area. This needs to include all streets, not just busy streets. I see opportunities throughout the inner, inner east side when I walk around that are on busy corridors and quieter streets where multifamily mixed income housing could be built. I am a member of Portland Neighbors Welcome and ask that the inner east side for all plan in um, be included in the housing production strategy that you will be developing soon to prioritize housing availability in the highly desirable inner east side neighborhoods for all. Thank you. Next up, we have Eric Lindsay. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Um, today, I speak to support Portland Neighbors Welcome Inner East Side concept and the four floors for corner stores and corner stores. Um, lots have been has been said about all of the benefits of a lot more housing and high opportunity neighborhoods in Portland, and I won't restate that. But one part of this uh, proposal that I think is just really exciting um, is this idea of corner stores. And you know we have big swaths of Portland where it's kind of just housing, 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 a lot of single family homes, and then commercial strips. And uh, I currently live, I'm lucky enough to live in the Boise neighborhood uh, right off of Mississippi, and I live two blocks from so many different things. And I just think it is absolutely so much fun to be able to walk to the coffee shop, to um, to the corner store, uh, take my kids to get their hair cut, all of that, literally just a few steps from my front door. And I think that a lot of folks in Portland would find it wonderful uh, to make big areas of Portland um, have those corner stores and coffee shops literally just around the corner. Uh, you know, people love to rag on Portland and and whatnot. And I think these are this is one of those opportunities to really kind of take an optimistic um, uh, step forward 
and make Portland uh, an even more wonderful place to live. And I, I encourage you to uh, really seriously consider uh, the proposal from Portland Acres Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have Joel Bravo, but I don't believe they joined us. Uh, we'll move on to Tony Jordan. Hello. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, my name is Tony Jordan, and I am here to support the Eastside for All plan and urge its inclusion in the housing needs analysis. Um, I've lived in Portland for more than 20 years, uh, but before I moved here, I spent se several summers and long vacations exploring the inner east side while visiting a relative who's lived here for a long time. Um, and when we moved to Portland uh, back in the early 2000s, we moved for two reasons. Uh, my wife and I couldn't afford to li keep living in coastal California, largely due to the same housing dynamics that have caught up to us here. And because we love the neighborhoods we visited in Portland, walkable streetcar neighborhoods filled with walk-up apartments, and especially the rare remaining corner store coffee shop like Palio or the Clinton Street Market. Um, I do a lot of work in in zoning and 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 parking reform policy um, around the country now, and I compare building a sustainable and walkable city to growing a garden. Like you know, a lot of the work we've done so far, I liken to clearing the rocks and weeds from a plot where you want to grow a garden. Um, but that's, and that's specifically like the parking, we've eliminated our parking mandates recently. And that, that does, and we've, we've up zoned with the residential residential infill project for some missing middle. And that does um, create an environment where we can grow a city, but we can't stop there. We have to, um, you can't just remove the rocks and weeds. You have to plant the seeds. And I think that this proposal to, not only analyze our um, housing needs, but also to, um, you know, you, you have to you, up zoning with allowing these kinds of apartments and this this um, to like everyone else is saying four uh, four floors and corner stores really does kind of um, plant the seeds for the city we want to see in the future. Um, and then of course there's still work to be done, like adding more transit and and dealing with any problems that might pop up. But um, please do. Uh, pa uh, approve this plan and include Eastside for All in the housing needs analysis. Thank you. Next up, we have Peter Lacano. Hi, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Peter Lasiano, um, and I'm speaking to you today in support of including the Inner East Side for All proposal as part of the housing production strategy. Um, as someone who lives in an apartment on a non-arterial in Buckman, this proposal is personal to me. My home was able to be built because it sits on one of the rare non-arterial parcels that is zoned commercial mixed use. Unlike most of the new multifamily homes in Portland, my building sits on a quiet, low traffic street. I open my windows and instead of being bombarded with car noise and auto exhaust, I hear the birds in the trees next to my building and the occasional sound of a bike pedaling past on the greenway. This sounds cliche, but it is my daily lived reality. And yet my neighborhood is highly walkable and most of my errands can be completed within a 10 minute walk. At one point I was even able to walk to work. Because I can live so much of my life without driving, I can avoid contributing to the congestion in our streets and our city's traffic safety crisis. The mixed use zoning down my street enables thriving local businesses such as Crema Coffee and a vibrant public plaza, which you may know as the Rainbow Road that is one of Portland's most beloved spaces. I'm speaking today because I want more people to have the same opportunity. In fact, achieving many of our city's stated goals, whether it's increasing housing affordability, boosting local businesses, reducing traffic deaths, and combating the climate crisis depends on it. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Barry Cochran. I don't think they've joined us. We'll move on to Cass Cole. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Cass Cole, and I'm speaking in favor of uh, the Inner East Side for All um, strategy to be put in the housing production strategy. I'm a Portlander of over 10 years, uh, spending most of that time renting and working on the Inner East Side, I'm now a homeowner um, in Madison South. Uh, in my spare time, I, I coordinate volunteers for a local family shelter, and I'm also a housing attorney representing tenants in eviction proceedings. When they're being evicted, the question my clients ask me is, where do we go? Where does my family go? 
we couldn't make it work here, so where can we make it work? So when I get asked what, what my clients and what my shelter guests need, my number one answer is more housing options, period. The vast majority of my clients are struggling to stay housed and to re-enter housing because they have too few options in the market. When there's too few options, your rent goes up, and at the same time, your ability to move goes down. My second answer would be more housing options where families can walk or bus to where they need to go instead of spending precious rent and food money on gas. The four floors and a corner store model provides both housing options and livable, sustainable neighborhoods for all kinds of families. Inner Northeast and Southeast Portland is a fabulous area of the city with a lot to offer a lot more families. If only there were options available to them. That's why I ask you to support including Inner East Side for All's plan in the housing production strategy. Thank you for your time. Next up, we have Annie Callen. Hi, uh, my name is Annie Callen. I live in the Hazelwood neighborhood. Um, this will shock nobody, but I'm speaking today in support of the proposal from Portland Neighbors Welcome to include upzoning for Inner East Side Portland in the housing production strategy. I live in Outer East Portland and I commute to Northwest Portland. So think about the carbon impact of that commute. If I could afford to live closer to where I work, and if we could all do that, it would improve not just our lives, but the health of our city, our communities, and our planet. It might sound hyperbolic, but the truth is that small, thoughtful, incisive changes can often have outsized impacts. Now I'm gonna be controversial just to spice things up a little bit. Um, I don't believe that housing is a human right. I'm a libertarian and I maintain that nothing which requires the labor of others is a human right. However, I recognize the enormous tragedy that it is when people don't have access to affordable housing. And the great thing is we can make that happen and we can do it in a way that we all agree on. This is a great idea. We're not asking government to do more, we're asking government to do less. We're asking government to lift burdensome restrictions which prevent Portlanders from making intelligent choices for ourselves about how we want to live, where we want to live, and how we want to get around. By removing antiquated restrictions, you can lower housing costs across the whole city, improve neighborhoods, reduce homelessness, reduce transportation costs, including the cost that the city pays to maintain these systems, and make Portland more accessible and welcoming for everyone. How often do you get such a great chance to do less and get so much more? Thank you very much. Next up, we have Lacey Patterson. Hello, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you for taking the time to hear testimony on the first reading of a pretty technical item. I'm Lacey Patterson. I'm an urban planner and a member of Portland Neighbors Welcome and a resident of the Inner East Side in the new minted District 2. I'm speaking today because I believe that the city has the capacity to provide more housing options to more people in areas such as mine. I live in a townhome across the street from a five-story residential and mixed-use building, um, and I absolutely love it. Uh, like many others who've spoken before me, uh, I'm really fortunate in that I'm able to walk to the store, library, pharmacy, parks, restaurants, hair salon, even my dentist. Uh, if you can name it, I'm just about sure I can comfortably walk to it. I believe that this city um, can make this a reality for many more people than we allow for today. And part of that includes more floors, as you've heard, in our neighborhoods. Uh, I encourage you to support initiatives like the Inner East Side for All in the housing needs analysis and the housing production strategy and zoning uh, update conversations moving forward. And that's it for me. I know my time's not up, but I'll go ahead and yield. Thank you for your time and I hope you'll have a blessed day. Next up, we have Ben Schoenberger. Mayor, commissioners, thank you. Uh, I'm here today speaking on behalf of Housing Land Advocates. I'm a member of the board uh, with that organization. We're an organization that supports 
affordable housing and smart land use policies that further the goal of uh, affordable housing uh, throughout the region and the state. Um, the board urges you to support the Inner East Side for All uh, proposal as part of the housing needs analysis and housing production strategy. It really is critical to include upzoning of high opportunity areas as one of the strategies in the housing production strategy that the city will adopt. Um, this enables all kinds of people of different backgrounds and uh, ethnicities and races to live in areas that they might not otherwise be able to. Um, that's an important part of the growth of our city uh, to be a more equitable and focused place. Um, on a personal note, um, this year uh, marks the 30th anniversary of my first moving to Portland. Um, and I want people to have the same opportunities that I did uh, 30 years ago. Um, I've lived in different neighborhoods all over the Inner East Side, and I think that would not um, be possible for um, my soon to be graduating from college son like I was um, at that point in my life. So I'm eager for those opportunities to be spread amongst more folks as it was uh, given to me as an opportunity. And that is one of many reasons that we support the Inner East Side for All proposal as part of the housing production strategy. Thank you. Steph, we have Robin Yee. Mayor Wheeler, members of council. For the record, my name is Robin Yee and I live in Montevilla. Today, I wanna to urge this council to consider upzoning the Inner East Side and support the Inner East Side for All proposal brought forward by housing advocates today. I believe Portland can be a place where we can breathe clean air, have a roof over our heads, and support our loved ones through these increasingly challenging times. A resilient community is a connected community, a place where neighbors feel welcome and social bonds can be formed. In addition to our many challenges, we face an epidemic of loneliness, and that becomes much harder when our city is designed to go mainly from front doors to cars to parking lots and back. I believe our neighborhoods need to be places where we can live in harmony together and better enjoy the best thing about our city, its wonderful people. I support a vision of four floors and corner stores in close to neighborhoods because we can already see how vibrant it makes our city. Many of Portland's great streets and livable corridors, so I think Belmont, Burnside, Stark, Hawthorne, Division, are mixed use zoning and thrive when allowed to build denser. All Portlanders benefit from walkable mixed income neighborhoods. Every neighborhood in our city should be open and available to people with diverse backgrounds and incomes for every age, wage, and stage of life. This is where Portland needs to go. Thank you for your time. Next up, we have Sam Chandler. Hello, uh, my name is Sam Callen. Uh, I live one block from Lentz Park in Southeast Portland, and I'm here to tell you why I support creating a great deal more housing in Portland. So I grew up in Michigan, but I just moved here September 1st. So I've been here for about two months. I sold my house in Michigan to move here. And now that I'm here, there's no more homes for me to buy. I don't necessarily want to buy a house because there's a lot of investment in that that I just don't really care about. But in America, you build family wealth by investing in a mortgage. And I want to do that here in Portland, Oregon. Um, I want to live on the same block as my friends and family. I kind of have a dream of us all living in a multifamily housing unit, not like a, sh a shared kitchen or anything, but like just actually living as an extended family unit together so we can grow together. Um, and we need more opportunities to put those things and just putting them right on the corridors isn't going to do it. Our inner uh, suburbs, our outer suburbs, everywhere where you can have housing, there's people who want to live here. So let's stop saying, no, you're not allowed to move to Portland, and instead say, welcome in, help us thrive, get a job, get housing, bring your weirdness to Portland. That's what I did. Um, I work as a planning and mapping consultant for some municipalities back in Michigan, and they keep doing this thing where they run the assessments and they say, okay, we need to do this, we need to do that. And so the city will pass an ordinance saying we've legalized ADUs, but within a couple of years, only like one or two have been built, only one or two bike lanes have been built, and that's because they don't follow the process all the way through to do if-then scenarios and say, okay, is this sufficient to create the housing we need? What you heard today is that 
there is enough room to create the housing needed, but what else needs to happen so that that housing actually gets created? You know, follow the process all the way through, comprehensively upzone the city so I can buy in. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Jacob Appenis. Hey there, Portland City Council. For the record, my name is Jacob Appenis. I'm 25 years old, a lifelong resident of Portland and a member of Sunrise PDX, a local youth-led climate justice organization. At Sunrise PDX, we focus on transportation justice. In the past, this has meant fighting against freeway industry, fighting against the freeway industrial complex and their expensive, unsustainable projects. Today, while that fight still rages on, we are working to fight for something as opposed to playing defense. Sunrise PDX wants to see a city where buses come every five minutes instead of every 15 to 60. We want infrastructure that protects bikers from cars, and we want to see a plan that takes vision zero seriously. We, most importantly, want to build a transportation system that's car-free or car light. 40% of the state's carbon emissions come from transportation. It's time to change that. This is achieved not only through improvements to public transit, regional rail, and safe bicycling infrastructure. It's also achieved through good housing policy. Policies that allow that policies that encourage dense housing development near jobs, schools, businesses, and parks allow many more people to live in walking distance of their needs. Dense multifamily housing also supports local business development, creating a, the virtuous cycle needed for amenity-rich neighborhoods. Dense multifamily housing also improves transit service. By having more residents in our walkable neighborhoods, it increases demand for TriMets, buses, and max lines. This encourages TriMet to increase service in these areas, which then encourages neighbors to take transit more often. It's another virtuous cycle brought along with denser housing. In summary, housing policy is transportation policy. We should be fighting for a city where everyone's needs can be met without a private vehicle, and dense housing development can help helps in this fight. Sonaris PDX supports Portland Neighbors Welcome's campaign to upzone the inner east side. The city should include inner east side for all as a strategy in their housing production strategy. Thank you. Next up, we have Henry Onoroff. Thank you, mayors and commissioners. My name is Henry Onoroff. I live in the Elliott neighborhood of Northeast Portland. Uh, I encourage you to both approve the housing needs analysis and include allowing four floors and corner stores on all lots across the Inner East Side as a key component of the housing production strategy. Uh, my partner and I are raising our daughter uh, in a small townhouse a few doors down from the Russell, a six-story apartment building that's home to a diverse group of 68 families and individuals, which is 68 families who live walking distance to transit, good schools, restaurants, grocery stores, and Irving Park, the things that you know, I love about this neighborhood. Our uh, now almost two-year-old uh, daughter, Zadie, you can see her playing over there, uh, had her first ever neighborhood play date with a baby who lived in that apartment building, which only happened because the Russell offered an attainable home for that baby's parents. Now, I want Zadie and every other kid in Portland to grow up down the street from a bunch of friends uh, who invite her over to play or walk over to play at our house. Uh, what'll make that possible is an abundance of homes that are attainable to young families and neighborhoods that are enriching places to raise children. And the way to get that is many more mid-rise apartments like the Russell uh, across the Inner East Side, not on high traffic arterials, but nestled into neighborhoods where it's safer for kiddos to play outside. Now, the first step of that uh, to make that a reality is to direct BPS to include legalizing four floors and corner stores on all lots across the Inner East Side in the housing production strategy. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Trisha Kent. Hi, let's see. My name is Trisha Kent. I'm a resident of Northeast Portland. I've been here for a year now. Um, and I wanted to share my excitement about the vision of four floors and corner stores for the future of Portland. My partner and I, um, much like Henry, are working on starting a family and um, we keep coming back to the same priorities for um, our future and for the neighborhood, cultivating inclusive community and having ease of transportation with our little ones. Um, we love biking, we love walking, and we love taking public transportation. Um, and instilling those values in our kids. So we love that upzoning as a housing production strategy can make this dream a reality for us, as well as for so many other Portlanders who depend on these resources. And we also know that right now the Inner East Side is ripe with opportunity to develop inclusionary housing, and that everyone wins from the environment to transportation to housing developers to our beloved neighborhood now and for our kids and generations to come. 
Uh, next, we have Luke Norman. I don't think they've joined us. We'll move on to Will Frewer. Honorable Mayor and Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Will Fruworth, and I live in Outer Northeast in the Parker School District, and I'm here to speak in support of the Inner East Side for All proposal from Portland Neighbors Welcome. We're here today because the Council is considering the most critical issue facing Portland and our region today, which is our severe housing shortage and its impact on livability. This body and city staffers have already devoted significant time and resources to address Portland's housing shortage through the construction of new shelter facilities, efforts to streamline the permitting process for new development, incentives to convert empty office buildings to apartments, and exemptions from system development charges for new affordable housing. These are all steps in the right direction, but the fact is that with our critical housing shortage, we must do all these things and so much more to stimulate the production of much new housing in Portland. As the land available for development surrounding our city is limited by state law, we must look for every possible location in our city limits. As Portlanders, we love our neighborhoods of single family homes, big lawns, leafy trees. However, our current housing stock is simply insufficient to meet the needs of our community. We must move now to build up, to allow property owners and developers to meet this demand with new multifamily housing especially in the close-in parts of the city with the best access to jobs, economic opportunity, and transportation, such as the inner east side. Thank you. Next up, we have Peter Finley Fry. Let's start. I, uh, Peter Finley Fry, I have to admit this is a little weird, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon. I am changing the subject now. Uh, we're not going to talk about Southeast. I'm going to make some statements first, which are rhetoric. One is I do not believe supply is a problem. I also do not believe BDS is the problem. I believe the problem is affordability and the way our capitalistic system works. And I want going forward to really have the Planning Bureau, who's done an excellent job, to ask us two questions. The first question is, what is growth? I have a garden. My garden during the spring grows like mad, very tall. And for the rest of the year, it doesn't grow up. It doesn't create more units. It creates culture. We need to discuss this issue about what is growth. I was at a meeting this morning. They were all talking about growth creates wealth. I don't know if that's exactly true, so we need to ask that question. What is growth? Second question is, what is livability? Are we just building units or are we building homes? That's a critical difference. We can build units. We can build cheap units anywhere, everywhere. Can we build homes? Can we build places where people can live, grow, and thrive? The, those are the two questions that I feel we should be discussing going forward. And um, that's it for me. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Mayor, that completes testimony. Thank you. And Peter, thank you. And I, I agree that does look slightly awkward there. You in the, the large room uh, practically alone there. And uh, thanks for bearing with us over these few weeks here while we're we're in transition from one council chambers to another. Uh, so colleagues, as Keelan just said, that completes public testimony on this item. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions that you would like to make at this stage in the process before we move this to the next phase? Seeing none, the written record will remain open until Friday, December 8th at 5 p.m. Friday, December 8th at 5 p.m. That means people can continue to submit emails and information. This item is now continued until December 13th at 10.30 a.m., time certain. That will be the second reading, and the council intends to vote on the item then. However, if members of council introduce new amendments, for example, amendments based on the testimony we received today, they will be published on December 11th on the Housing Needs Analysis Project website. Should there be new amendments, council may decide 
to reopen the record to hear more on those amendments. To preserve your ability to testify, please plan to attend the December 13th meeting. With that, colleagues, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.